In this last module of chapter 3, we will be looking at divisions and structures of the brain. We will be looking at how our brain looked in our embryonic stage, in our fetal stage, and eventually in its fully developed form as adult. The brain's early development helps us understand why the brain is composed of five divisions. When we were embryos, which you do not remember, but that is when you were two to eight weeks in your mother's womb, perhaps your mom did not even know she was pregnant during this time, this is what our brain looked like. You can see that it is made up of three main lumps. This would eventually become your forebrain, this would be divided also and become midbrain, and then the hindbrain, which would be divided into two major sections. This would be your spinal cord. When you became a fetus, which would be after week eight, uh, please note that after week eight, uh, uh, our brain has already been formed to a certain extent. It's not fully developed, but uh, there is a proliferation of cells at a rate of approximately 250,000 neurons per minute. And so you could see that the rapid change from just, say, early embryonic stage two to three weeks here to the fetal stage, which could have been as early as nine weeks, the forebrain now became two sections, and that is now the diencephalon and the telencephalon. The midbrain uh, became the mesencephalon, and the hindbrain also divided into two major sections, and that's what we call the metencephalon and the myelencephalon. Please note that one way to memorize this is that these are all in alphabetical order except for the cerebral cortex, which is the telencephalon. Other than that, every single one of these is in alphabetical order. The spinal cord would then be here at the bottom. You see the word encephalon in everything, and that is because encephalon means within the head. In humans, as in other vertebrates, the telencephalon, that is the left and right cerebral hemispheres, undergoes the greatest growth during development. The other four divisions of the area are often referred to collectively as the brain stem. The myelencephalon is often referred to as the medulla. Here you can appreciate, again, the human brain as we've been seeing it throughout. And so as we look at this in here, I want you to perceive the outer layer, but also please note that uh, within the telencephalon we have the diencephalon and the mesencephalon and the metencephalon, and eventually the myelencephalon, and we go down to the spinal cord. We'll start at the bottom and work our way to the top. Looking specifically at myelencephalon, we are talking about this specific baby blue area here. This is what's known as the medulla, and this is composed largely of tracts that uh, carry signals between the rest of the brain and the body. As you already learned, the afferent nerves carry sensory information from our body to our brain, and then there our brain responds by sending uh, efferent nerves uh, that would generate some type of motor output. This is where we also find the origin of reticular formation, which is a nuclei network that's involved in various functions. I'd like you to think of them as two chromosomes or well, uh, uh, strands that are responsible for our cardiac functions and our breathing functions and our circulatory and sleep movement, etc. And I'll show you a picture of, of this in a bit. Uh, please note that this reticular formation is a complex network of about 100 tiny nuclei, and this is basically what occupies the central core of the brainstem from the posterior boundary of the myelencephalon to the anterior boundary of the midbrain. This would be a good idea for you to check up on those directions of the vertebrate. Posterior, referring to the back. Anterior, referring to the front. The parts uh, of the reticular formation seem to play a role in arousal. The various nuclei of reticular formation are involved in uh, functions that were stated earlier, but also attention, movement, maintenance of muscle tone, and various other uh, reflexes. As we look at the other part, uh, and that is the metencephalon, another part of the hindbrain, we know that this is uh, made up of the pons, 
and the cerebellum. The pons would be this uh, nudge that you would see here, this purple one, and then the cerebellum would be this large piece of the brain. The pons is uh, in the ventral surface, and by ventral, you know that when we're talking about the brain, we're talking about the bottom. Dorsal would be up on top. Where, um, as we look at uh, this component, the pons, uh, the motor, and uh, it's responsible for motor and sleep regulation. Uh, there was a case of a child who uh, was unable to sleep. This was unusual for a one-year-old to suffer from insomnia, but uh, when the doctors looked further, it turns out that uh, there was. Uh, appeared to be a lot of bone tissue that was pressing up against the, uh, the brain. The skull was uh, directly impacting the ce uh, cerebellum, which had an effect on the pons. Uh, what they had to do is they had to cut and sort of shave the bone in the back so that this could have enough space and not be pressed against it. And uh, when the individual healed and they were able to keep the bone from regenerating and growing there, uh, the individual no longer had difficulties sleeping. We also find that uh, the motor and sleep regulation has uh, plays uh, pawns plays a role in us not acting out our dreams while you and I are asleep. If you and I were dreaming that we're running, for the most part, the pawns is responsible for keeping our major muscles intact and uh, therefore not act out our dreams. The cerebellum is an important sensory motor structure, and that is involved in coordination. And uh, please note that the cerebellum uh, is uh, one of the parts of the brain that's often damaged with individuals that are shaken while they're babies, and that is what we call the shaken baby syndrome. Uh, doing so at an age where the individual does not have a lot of muscle uh, and control of their brain could have them uh, be concussed, and there could even be a contusion in which the brain moves from side to side, and sometimes individuals that suffer from this sustained injuries to the cerebellum as well as to the cerebral cortex. Please note that uh, although it says here dorsal surface for the cerebellum, that would be dorsal in relation to the spine, but as we're talking about the brain, please note this would be posterior and it would be toward the ventral part of the overall brain. Here we can appreciate a picture of the reticular formation, and it is these two straw-like pieces, and you may remember this was essential in uh, the functions of arousal and, and various cardiac and circulatory and respiratory reflexes. In theory, if we were to tear this up, we, we could die, and uh, this is one of the reasons why in movies, sometimes you see those heroes like Chuck Norris who may just twist the neck of a guard somewhere in front of a palace and suddenly the individual is out. And the idea behind is that if you have enough strength, you could potentially kill the individual as you would interrupt the uh, activity that was being sent through the reticular formation to our heart and to our lungs and everything else that keeps us alive. And this, in fact, can be seen when individuals that kill chickens. Sometimes you may have heard um, of chickens that are killed by sometimes just snapping their neck or spinning them around. And essentially what you'd be doing is tearing or interrupting the signals that would be sent through reticular formation. You can also appreciate a, a better picture of the cerebellum and of the pons and the medulla. We now work our way up to the midbrain, and that's what we call the mesencephalon. Please note that the midbrain is made up of two divisions, the tectum and the tegmentum. And so when we talk about the tectum, we're talking about this part right here. Tegmentum, we're talking about this part here. This would have been a cut across right here. Try to figure out what type of cut this was by looking back through your notes. The tectum part of the brain is the dorsal surface of the midbrain, and this is composed of two colliculi. This is where we have the superior uh, colliculi that you see here, and then the inferior colliculi, which are not seen here, but you could see it pointed here. Please note that the inferior colliculi are known for having auditory functions, whereas the superior colliculi 
are going to be seen uh, active when we have visual motor, motor functions. We'll be talking about this in more detail in chapter 6 and 7. If you haven't figured out what type of cut this is in here, uh, it is a horizontal plane that we're able to appreciate here. We also see the periaqueductal gray area, and this is of great interest, especially for individuals trying to come up with ways to numb our bodies so we, we cannot experience pain. We'll be talking about this in more detail in future chapters, but please note that this plays a role uh, in anesthesia analgesics. There's gray matter that's situated around the cerebral aqueduct, which is the cavity here, the, the hole. And uh, through this hole, uh, we uh, have cerebral spinal fluid that's uh, flowing in and out. The duct connecting the third and the fourth ventricles is basically this. This area is of particular interest because of its role in mediating the analgesic effects of opiate drugs. And we'll talk about the receptor sites that are present there. We also see substantia nigra here, uh, which is... Um, a part of the midbrain that combined with the red nucleus that you see here, these are of interest to researchers investigating Parkinson's disease. As through posthumous studies, we've found that these two areas, substantia nigra and red nucleus, uh, are significantly degenerated uh, in the brain of Parkinson's disease patients. And so we believe that they're both important components of the sensory motor system, uh, and that's why we, the individuals who may have suffered from degeneration from this thing are, are unable to control, uh, and they have those, those tremors that Parkinson's is known for. As we're working our way to the top, we've now reached the diencephalon. The diencephalon is made up of two structures, uh, thalamus and the hypothalamus, which we'll see in the next slide. Please note that the thalamus uh, is comprised of many different pairs of nuclei, and these nuclei are primarily known for their sensory relay purposes. The, you will see in chapter 6 and 7 that the thalamus is key and sorting the messages that are received from our organs and nerves and then sending them to the corresponding areas of the cerebral cortex. For example, the eye uh, would send information from here in the optic nerve over to the lateral part of the thalamus. From there, it would then branch out and it would determine that it would be sent over to somewhere in the occipital lobe. That is the, the lateral part of the thalamus, and that's what's known as the lateral geniculate nuclei. The medial part, which would be closer to the inside, this would be used whenever we have uh, auditory uh, signals. So when these sound waves come in and they impact our tympanic membrane and have a chain reaction on the ossicles and then our hair cells and our basilar membrane are moved and waved, that would then go through the uh, hindbrain to midbrain and eventually make its way to the medial part of the thalamus. That's the medial geniculate nuclei, also known as the MGN. And the ventral posterior nuclei is responsible for somatosensory relay station. And so we're talking about any sensations in our body, and that has to do with anywhere all over our body. For the purpose of testing you on this, what, where would the ventral posterior nuclei be? You may pause the video and try to figure it out. If you said that ventral would be uh, toward the bottom and at the top, you are correct. And so this is basically with a thalamus. I want you to know that uh, the thalamus, we have two, we have one on the left and one on the right. These are two lobe structures that constitute the top of the brain stem, the dorsal part. Uh, one lobe sits on each side of the third ventricle, and the two lobes are joined by what we call the massa intermedia, which runs through the ventricle. Uh, the visible, uh, visible on the surface of the thalamus are white lamina, which are layers that are composed of myelinated axons, and you could see these right here. 
you can see that it looks kind of like a peace sign. That is basically that. I want you to know that the thalamus is basically a relay station, similar to a mail room. See, where I work, there are hundreds of employees, and when I receive mail, then it is the mail room's job to sort it specifically to my mailbox. Otherwise, if it goes everywhere, then there'd be chaos, and nobody would get their mail. The thalamus does that exactly. It sorts the sensory input that's being received, whether it be visual, whether it be auditory, uh, whether it be somatosensory, uh, and you will learn later that uh, the olfactory uh, stage uh, sense does not go there. It has their own, so we'll, we'll talk about that later. Uh, but uh, other than that, the thalamus would have sorted out the energy that was received, and uh, it would have then sent it to its corresponding area of the cerebral cortex. The other structure of the diencephalon is the hypothalamus. Uh, hypothalamus uh, is, sits right below our thalamus, and in fact, hypo means below, and that's why it gets its name. This is a, an important part of our brain, just like others, uh, that's responsible for homeostasis. You may remember that homeostasis is maintaining the steady internal environment of your temperature in your body. Uh, for the most part, if you stay in 98 degrees, then that's good, but if there were to be a hot day or you have a fever and you're reaching 102, then the hypothalamus would do whatever it can to maintain your body temperature at 98. Uh, this works very closely with pituitary gland. And, and please note that while I just made use of the body temperature as an example, it also is responsible for hormonal balances and for uh, circadian rhythms in, in terms of whether you are uh, a person that wakes up early during the day and goes to bed early at night, or if you're a person that goes to bed late at night, uh, all these different regulations would be controlled for by your hypothalamus. Uh, hunger, sleep pattern, sex drive, and many other things are controlled by this part. The pituitary gland is a, uh, a gland that is a, a master gland to the rest of our endocrine system. Uh, our endocrine system is a network that is all over our body, well, in our upper body, and this is basically what controls, uh, the pituitary gland is what controls our ovaries, uh, our testicles, um, the pancreas, and many other glands and organs in our body. Uh, this uh, is working in tandem with the hypothalamus as it receives uh, information from the rest of the body. The pituitary gland sends it over to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus then gives an order for the pituitary gland to then secrete hormones uh, to to send a signal for the organs to secrete hormones at the rate that is needed. Please note that the pituitary gland dangles from the hypothalamus, so you see a picture of that here, and this would be the equivalent of that as well, and, and this is on the ventral surface of the brain. We also see the optic chiasm, and we'll talk about this later. This is the point at which the optic nerve from each eye come together, and we'll discuss this in more detail in chapter 6. And we also see the mammillary bodies, which would be right here, the hypothalamus. And this is an inferior surface of the hypothalamus, meaning behind the pituitary. And this is, as I stated earlier, the relay station for the olfactory system. Whereas the eye and the sound and somatosensory areas go to the thalamus, uh, the smell, the sense of smell, has a specific part, uh, its own relay station, and that is what we call the mammillary bodies. Please note that the mammillary body and others are uh, part of the brain's limbic system, which we will discuss in further detail later. We've finally made it to the telencephalon, and this is the outermost part of our forebrain which is responsible for analyzing sensory processing and higher brain functions. Thinking, decision-making, hopefully a good one, is controlled for by the cerebral cortex. We'll be talking about this for the next slides. And this is the largest division of the human brain. It mediates the brain's most complex functions. It initiates voluntary movement, interprets sensory input, and mediates complex cognitive processes such as learning, speaking, problem solving. 
The cerebral cortex is a layer of tissue that covers the cerebral hemispheres. Because it is mainly composed of small unmyelinated neurons, it is gray, and it is often referred to as the gray matter. The layer beneath the cortex is mainly composed of large myelinated axons, which are white, and because of that, they're referred to as white matter. Here you can see a plane that uh, is frontal. This would be the brain as we see it, and then if we would cut it right across, this, this plane, frontal plane, then we would be able to access all this rich content. And you could see in here, as I stated earlier, that on the outside we have gray matter, which, you know, it's made up of soma and dendrites. And then on the inside we have white matter, which would be made up of myelinated components. Please note that the convolutions uh, basically is a sinuous fold of the surface of the brain. That is what we see right here, having a lot of curves and turns all throughout in here. The reason why we have this sinuous layout is because it allows for the increase of the surface area without increasing the overall volume of the brain. The brain is also made up of these fissures, which are large, deeper furrows, and so you could see that we have the lateral fissure here, and we have a central fissure here. You could also appreciate the central fissure here, you could appreciate the lateral fissure here, and these are basically deeper furrows, deep ruts or grooves or lines or wrinkles that are seen in the brain. And we'll see how these are influential in separating the different lobes from each other. The longitud longitudinal fissure is the largest of them all, and this is what separates the right hemisphere from the left. We also have sulci. Also, you may have heard of this pronounced as sulci. Sulcus is how we refer to it as a singular. And these are small furrows. So you could see that the, there would be a uh, sulcus here, be another sulcus here, another sulcus here. And these are smaller, not as deep furrows. The ridges between the fissures and the sulci are these right here. And this is what we call the gyri or the gyrus for singular. The cerebral commissures basically are um, connecting tracks for the hemispheres. And so the largest that we have and the one we'll be focusing on is the corpus callosum and that's what you can see here. This is the largest hemisphere connecting tract in our brain. Please note that uh, this is uh, useful in facilitating the transportation of communication from the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere. Cerebral lobes are not functional units, um, meaning they do not only have one set of functions. The cerebral cortex just happens to be folded into and on, on itself and at certain places during development. And so here we will look at the different uh, lobes, cerebral lobes that we have. And before we go on to that, I'd like to also speak of the two major fissures on lateral surface for each hemisphere. You have the central and lateral fissures, which we can appreciate a little bit different in this picture. Here you see the central uh, fissure, and that is what separates the frontal lobe from the parietal. Here you have the lateral fissure, which separates the temporal lobe from the frontal lobe. And in the back we do not have fissures, but this is where we would have our occipital lobe. Please note that uh, the three major gyri on the lateral surface of each hemisphere are right here. You have the pre-central, this is this gyrus here, this ridge, and there's a little furrow over here. So you have this. You have the post-central gyrus. This will come in handy when we look at somatosensory uh, sensation stuff. We also have the superior temporal, and that would be this right here. These are the three major gyri on the lateral surface, and they're found on each hemisphere. Please note that when we look at the four different lobes we see here, at the occipital lobe, this is where we analyze our visual input. Everything we see would then go through the lateral geniculate thalamus, the LGN, 
hypothalamus. Then we'd swing around over to the occipital lobe where we would analyze it and then make a decision as to what to do about it. The parietal, which would be the purple one here, this is uh, plays roles in receiving the location of both objects and our own bodies and in directing our attention to things that are important. The temporal has three general function areas. You have the superior temporal that's involved in hearing and language. You have the inferior temporal which identifies complex visual patterns. The medial temporal which is not visual from the usual side view but it is important in certain kinds of memory. And then we have the frontal lobe which has two distinct areas. I have the frontal lobe here. The precentral gyrus, which is what we see here, uh, and the adjacent frontal cortex is responsible for motor function, so our movement, what you and I are going to do. The frontal cortex, which is anterior to the motor cortex, and this over here, uh, this performs complex cognitive functions, planning responses, sequences, uh, evaluating the outcomes of potential patterns of behavior, assessing the significance of the behavior of others. These are some of the functions of the lobes. We'll be talking about these in greater detail in future chapters. Patellencephalon also has some subcortical structures, and so we'll be looking specifically at the limbic system. Although much of the subcortical portion of the telencephalon is taken up by axons that project to and from the neocortex, there are several large subcortical nuclear groups. Some of them are considered part of either the limbic system or the basal ganglia motor system. It is important to not be confused or misled by the word system in these contexts. It basically implies a level of certainty that is unwarranted. It is not entirely clear exactly what these hypothetical systems do, exactly which structure should be included in them, or even whether there is appropriate to view them as unitary system. When we look at the limbic system, this is a circuit of midline structures that circle the thalamus, uh, looking specifically limbic, which means ring. And so, <coughs> excuse me, this is why we see that the limbic system is made up of not one part, but of a ring of things that we see here. The limbic system is involved in the regulation of motivated behaviors, including the four F's of motivation, fleeing, feeding, fighting, and sexual behavior. Here you can see the major structures of the limbic system. The mammillary bodies, which you may remember earlier, we spoke about this in here, is involved in the olfactory relay station. It is not surprising that this would be involved in what we call the limbic system, which is motivated behavior such as fleeing, feeding, fighting, and sex, because it is often through smell that we are motivated to do certain things, including eating and, uh, and different smells could perhaps also generate some type of arousal for fleeing. So, not surprising that this is part of that. The hippocampus would be memory. And notice how close the hippocampus is to, right, the, in, in, in certain way relatively to the rest of the stuff. Uh, we find the olfactory relay station often works very good at helping us remember things. You may sometimes come across a smell if it is during the fall season, uh, maybe smelling pumpkin latte stuff would remind you of a specific time in your life. The amygdala is responsible for fear and aggression, and that is here, and we have one on each side. And uh, this uh, we find to be uh, smaller in animals that uh, are typically uh, roaming around and that... Uh, have the freedom to interact with others, whereas with animals that would have been confined and, and, and held in captivity and without a lot of exposure to other animals or humans, would actually have this uh, bigger and this would bring about their behavior. So we believe that there would be influence there. The fornix uh, is, uh, plays an important uh, role, but we do not know exactly what exactly what it does. Uh, the function. It is believed to be associated with memory, and uh, this is uh, part of the brain that has been demonstrated that if there's a 
surgery to it, a cutting of the fornix along its body, it can cause memory loss in humans. Um, it has been found that uh, this is most closely correlated with recall memory rather than recognition memory. And you may remember that from general psych that recall uh, is typically a lot harder than, than recognition. Recall would be maybe a blue book exam, which is recognition would be multiple choice. This means that damage to the fornix can cause difficulty in recalling long-term information, such as details of past events, but it has little effect on the ability to recognize objects or familiar situations. The cingulate is uh, responsible for recognizing angry or fearful facial expressions, and we'll talk about its relation to other parts of the occipital lobe later, and also the septum, which is involved with feelings of pleasure, and we'll talk about this also later. Notice how this ring is what makes up the limbic system. The basal ganglia uh, basically helps us control voluntary movement. And when we're talking about voluntary movement, it typically is because we may obtain a reward. When we started this chapter, you started with this picture that is projected up in the right corner, and it is of a gymnast who is engaging in voluntary movement for the purpose of winning a competition, we suppose. Please note that the major structures for this are also the amygdala, the striatum, which is the caudate nucleus, and the putamen, and then the globus uh, pallidus in here. Please note that uh, the uh, nucleus accumbens, which is what we see here, is uh, believed to play a role in the rewarding effects of addictive drugs and other reinforcers. And so this is why we believe that even with certain movements and with certain things, we would perhaps generate some type of pleasure. It is not unusual for individuals to say that after going dancing they feel much more relaxed and relieved and better about themselves and uh, it would not be surprising to find that this particular part, which again also generates a lot of pleasure when individuals take addictive drugs, uh, would make us feel that way and want to repeat that behavior of going dancing. Parkinson's disease is associated with the deterioration of a pathway that projects to the striatum from the substantia nigra of the midbrain. You may remember that from earlier, one of the slides, substantia nigra is associated with deterioration. And we've seen that in posthumous studies of people with Parkinson's disease.